Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Well, here we are in December 2022. As promised, I'm going to begin today uh, and on each Friday from here on for a little while. Now, obviously, uh, here we are in December, and that means that holiday season is upon us, uh, so there will be some breaks in my Friday presentations. But again, as I promised, I, I am going to begin a review and response to the new book by my friend Steve Gregg. It is entitled, Why Not Full Preterism? A Partial Preterist Response to a Novel Theological Innovation. Now, today is just simply going to be a type of introduction. I'm not going to get into real any real specific details. And I have to tell you, I have, I have struggled mightily with trying to determine exactly how to proceed in addressing Steve's book. And by the way, I mean it when I say he's my friend. He refers to me as his friend, and um, I believe that definitely. But... Uh, as I said, I struggle with how to proceed in this because, with all due respect to my friend, this book has so much error in it. Now, Steve's book purports to cover an awful lot of material. So, it would, it would be a massive project, massively time-consuming, for me to try to address every single page, basically, that I would almost need to in order to uh, respond to everything that Steve says. So I, I, will be, I, will be, I will be discussing Steve's book according to chapter headings, and then I'm going to pick out some of the major themes that Steve addresses and issues that he raises and then I'm going to spend some time, and I do this in my upcoming book. Lord willing, the book will be published uh, by the end of this year or perhaps right after the first of the year. Uh, my, my book is entitled Resurrection Feast Fulfilled. It is an examination of the relationship between the Feast of Sukkot and the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, i.e. on the last day. And so I have a special chapter in that book, dedicated to responding and to refuting Steve Gregg's hermeneutic. I call this the missing word, missing term, missing phrase, hermeneutic. And I'm not going to go into explaining all of that right now. But the bottom line is, Steve makes the argument over and over and over again, even though even though he admitted in our formal debate in 2013 held in Denver, Colorado, he admitted that to argue that because a given writer, a given text, does not use a specific word, or, word term, or phrase, that the doctrine cannot be there, he said that would be illegitimate. He said, I would certainly hope that I never use that hermeneutic. And yet throughout his book, he employs that very hermeneutic. And in my book that will be coming out again, Lord willing, very soon, I, I give many major examples of major fundamental arguments that Steve offers to try to refute preterism, and yet he employs this missing word hermeneutic. So <clears throat> let me say this. <clears throat> As I just stated, it would be a massive project to try to cover <laughs> everything that Steve says in this book. Now, by the way, it's only right that I do this because according to some friend of mine, friends of mine who have the Kindle version of Steve, Steve's book, one of them wrote to me and said that in his book, Steve mentions me by name 140 times. Now, I, I haven't counted them personally. I don't have a Kindle version of it, so I don't know I have no reason to doubt my friend who said he counted the number of times in his Kindle version. So 
obviously, now I do know, <laughs> I do know that in going through the book, Steve absolutely mentions my name over and over and over and over again. So I don't have any reason to doubt the 140 mention uh, claim that my friend made. But once again, what I was about to say is this. While I do not have every single thing, every topic, every theme, every motif in mind that I'm going to address, I have page after page after page after page of notes of contradictions within the book. I'm going to try to classify them, make them as succinct. I'm going to combine them in as much as I can into overall themes, motifs, and concepts, and address the major heading, address the major theme, address the major argument. Now, what I would like to ask of you, my viewers, is to do this. If you have a copy of Steve's book, and if you have it, I would recommend that you get it, okay? Look, full printerism has nothing to hide. If, Steve's Greg, if Steve Gregg's book is an effective probative expose and refutation of full preterism, then you need to know, and I certainly need to know. Need to know. But I have to tell you, from the beginning of the book to the last of the book, I literally sat just shaking my head at the weakness, the, the logical fallacies, the hermeneutical fallacies, and the exegetical fallacies that are in this book a priori assumptions and a priori type of argumentation permeate this book. And I'll try to demonstrate that and prove that to you as we go along. So here's my point. If you have this book and you think that Steve has made a really great point on any given text, on any given subject, then please do me a favor. <coughs> Pardon me. Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. Send me an email that says, you know, Don, on page such and such, Steve makes the following argument. You know, uh, be sure to give me the page number and be sure to give me the argument that he made. I mean, if you give me the page number, obviously I'll know where to go to find it. But just, just tell me, I find this argument to be particularly relevant, particularly strong, I would like to know how you would answer this argument. So I, I want your input into helping me to give uh, the most comprehensive and yet the most succinct and the most relevant, the most germane arguments and responses that I can possibly give. I, I don't want to be addressing irrelevant issues. I have no interest in that. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help the cause of preterism. I want to know the issues that you, the viewer, you, the reader, believe are the most relevant, the most powerful, the most logical, and the most scriptural in Steve's book. So again, if you don't have the book, get it and read it. Send me your thoughts. Send me your suggestions. Send me your questions. And I will consider them. I will compare your thoughts with my notes, which again is multiple, multiple pages of notes uh, in which I make note of what I believe are logical inconsistencies, exegetical fallacies, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do the very best that I can to pick out what I believe that you believe are the strongest arguments against full preterism because I want to address, I want to address the strongest arguments that Steve Gregg makes in his book. I want to address what you believe are the strongest arguments that he makes in this book. You know why? Well, because in this book of over 370 pages, or some 370 pages, which is, by any calculation, a major work. So if I can demonstrate that this highly respected commentator, and I respect him, I like him, very nice guy. So if I can demonstrate 
that his case against coveted eschatology is weak, fallacious, and flawed, and false, then guess what? It's to be rejected. So, with those things in mind, let me begin, and this may seem somewhat um, random, it may seem a tiny bit rambling, I hope not, <laughs> but I want to address some of the things that Steve says uh, in his preface. He begins in, on page 13, Roman numeral 13, by saying, I hope that nothing I have written may give the impression of an attack on other Christians. Those whom I am writing to correct initiated the attack against historic Christian truths and seek to unseat the views of all Christians who have lived in the first 19 centuries. Such innovators cannot be surprised to receive resistance from defenders of historic evangelical faith. Number uh, point, uh, Two points here. Number one, uh, Steve says it is not his purpose to offend. I believe this, that sincerely. Now, he says some things in the book that are borderline on that. Uh, perhaps that was just polemic fervor, and that's fine, okay? But he does not resort to name-calling except, you know, false teachers, arrogant, he uses that term of full preterist. And I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I have no intentions ever of being arrogant. But Steve Gregg claims that because of what full preterists claim, our view is arrogant. Now, again, it's certainly not intended to be that. But nonetheless, I take Steve Gregg's statement that his purpose is not to offend, it is not to attack. I take that at face value because in our formal public debate, and by the way, his debate is available for download on my website, donkpreston.com. You can go there, you can purchase it for a very, very minimal fee, and you can, uh, you can watch the whole debate. It's there for video or audio, either one. And not once in the debate that I feel did I ever feel that Steve Gregg was out of line in his decorum. So I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, after the debate, we parted as friends. We went out to eat uh, together, a, a little small group. We had a great time uh, conversing and discussing things. So I again, I take that at face value. It was an honor and a privilege to be able uh, to be that cordial and that friendly, I would welcome the opportunity to have another formal public debate with Steve Gregg because of his demeanor and to go into a, you know, more of a detailed discussion of his book against covenant, covenant eschatology. So those of you who have contact with Steve, and I do occasionally, not very often, uh, that may be something to consider in, in the future. Okay, to continue. He continues and he says, throughout the last 2,000 years, the church has divided over many issues. It seems that at any given time, there were, there were sincere Christians somewhere denying some doctrines that other believers held to be sacrosanct. One thing that no theological camp ever denied, however, was that the Bible teaches a second coming of Christ at the end of this present age. The future second advent of Christ has been held by Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, and Protestant churches of every denomination. Until very recently, this hope of the saints has, been, has not been a disputed doctrine in any Christian communion. And then he begins to point out how Max King of the Churches of Christ in the 1970s challenged that historical view. And then he tries to link full preterists, not as being members of Joseph Smith's view or John Nelson Darby's view, but saying, well, you know, Joseph Smith claimed to restore the truth, the lost truth. Darby claimed to be restoring the lost truth. So in that sense, Steve Gregg is saying, we are like Mormons and we are like dispensationalists. I suppose one could argue on, on one basic level, well, yes, preterists are saying that we are, in fact, teaching the truth on covenant eschatology, 
that historic Christianity has lost. Now, one thing that is more than remarkable to me about his statement, he acknowledges that there are all sorts of differences within historic Christianity. I mean, you've got after all, you've got partial preterist, you've got amillennialist, you've got postmillennialist, uh, you've got dispensationalist, and of course you've got pre-trib, post-trib, uh, mid, uh, post-trib, you've got mid-trib, and on and on and on and on. And Steve Gregg is essentially saying, that's okay. It's okay for Christianity to disagree about amill, post-mill, dispensational, and all of its variations, et cetera, et cetera, as long as, as we agree on the fundamentals. Well, here's an interesting point. In the book, Steve Gregg makes it a point of saying preterists are divided. They're all different branches of preterism. Some believe this and some believe that. Well, okay. Greg, Steve Gregg says it's okay for historical, traditional Christians to differ about the details of eschatology, whether all pre- or post-millennialism. We all agree on the basic fundamental fact of the second coming of Christ being in the future. And yet he castigates Christians, you know, full preterist Christians, for being divided. And yet all future or all full preterist, whether they take the millennium beginning in A.D. 70 or the millennium ending at A.D. 70, as just an example of that, whether there are corporate body resurrection advocates in the, in the full preterist view or individual body resurrection advocates, guess what? We all agree Christ came at the end of the age in AD 70. So why does the fact that preterists have divisions within our camps, how does that somehow affect the reality and the truth of covenant eschatology, whereas it's perfectly fine, according to Steve Gregg, that there are all of these different divisions within historic Christianity between all-mill, post-mill, and dispensationalism? You see, the legs of the lame are somewhat uneven. In this regard, on the one hand, it's okay to be divided in historic Christianity as long as you have a fundamental basic belief about the second coming. But in preterism, it's not okay to have disagreements and, quote, divisions because that proves there's something wrong with the preterist view. No, no, it doesn't prove that at all. So let, let, let me very hurriedly Go on. Uh, I made mention a moment ago. And, well, before I get there, on page 14, he says, some of us may be very open to allowing the scriptures to challenge certain widely held Christian viewpoints. However, whenever someone wants to say that literally all Christians have been wrong for 2,000 years concerning one of their major doctrines, the burden of proof would seem to lie heavily upon the challenger. Well, I would agree with that. I agree that the burden of proof lies upon the full preterist paradigm to defend and to substantiate our case. But here's what's interesting. Steve Gregg says, well, we're, we're, we're very open to allowing the scriptures to challenge certain wide held. And then he says, it is not enough to show as full preterists do. It's not enough to show that certain passages that have improperly been applied to the future are actually referencing events long past. Such a, a claim should not be regarded as too controversial. Okay, here's the point, however. Full preterists commonly point out that passage after passage after passage that Amillennialists, postmillennialists, and even dispensationalists commonly applied to the future cannot be applied in any way to the future. They were absolutely positively 
applicable to AD 70. So Steve Gregg says uh, it's not enough to show that certain passages that have improperly been applied to the future are actually referencing past events. Okay, if that's true, here's the problem. What if, and this is true, what if some of those texts that Steve Gregg says, yeah, you know what, they have been improperly applied to the future. But what if some of those texts are absolutely fundamentally linked with the end of the age parousia of Christ? In other words, Steve Gregg is saying, you know what, there are some passages that historic, uh, historic eschatology has improperly applied to the future. They, in fact, apply to AD 70. Guess what? The preterists would respond by saying, you are absolutely correct, Steve. And here's the point. Those very passages are directly parallel. And in fact, in many instances, they are the source of other passages that you are still applying to the future. So if these passages that you admit have historically been improperly applied to the end of the Christian age, if they in fact apply to AD 70, then since those very passages actually apply to AD 70, then since they are the source and or, and or directly parallel with other passages that you are still applying to the future, there's something wrong with your hermeneutic. Because if passage X has been improperly applied to the future and properly applies to AD 70, but passage X is the source of passage Y and directly parallel to it, then what is your hermeneutic for saying, okay, passage X, yeah, we've been wrong, it's actually AD 70, but passage Y is yet future, but wait, it's drawing on passage X. What's your hermeneutic? You see, folks, we cannot... It cannot just arbitrarily go through the New Testament and say, well, yeah, we've been wrong here, and yet this passage over here, again, drawn from here, parallel to this, it's still future. you got to have the proof. You have to have probative, powerful evidence. And that is exactly what is missing from Steve Gregg's book. Okay, well... Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to leave it there for today. I, I had many other things left to address in his preface. So let me close by simply saying this. Oh, by the way, one of the things that I'm going to spend a good bit of time on is Steve Gregg seems to think that Israel's feast days are, are basically the sum total of eschatological expectation. And he says, that's just, just not true. Well, I, I have just published, I mean, literally this week, as I make this presentation, a brand new book entitled Temple to Tell Us. And by the way, to all of you who have purchased a copy already, and the book has been doing exceptionally well, one of the very best that I've ever introduced, in this book, I demonstrate that the first century temple at Jerusalem, administered by the Levitical priesthood in obedience to the law of Moses, had to be standing for the first four feast days to be fulfilled. And if that's true, and it is, then the great question is, why would that same first century temple, administered by the Levites in accordance to the law of Moses, not have to be standing for the fulfillment of the final three feast days and Israel's final three feast days foreshadowed, foreshadowed the judgment, the parousia, and the resurrection? Since that temple does not stand today, and since Steve Gregg says the law of Moses was nailed to the cross and will never be restored, how can it be argued that there is any futurist eschatology? Either those last three feast days were fulfilled in the judgment, parousia, and resurrection in AD 70, or those promises found in those feast days, those typological feast days, failed, and in that sense, in, in that case, God's promises failed. 
go to my website, donkpreston.com. I'm introducing this book the entire month of, of uh, December 2022, U.S. orders only, total delivered price $12.95. Take advantage of it while the month is still young. It's, it's good until the end, of the end of the year. Okay, I'm out of time for today. Thank you for joining me here on this Friday morning on Morning Musings. You have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you on Monday.